In a world where key signals have been distorted by central bank activity through unprecedented quantitative easing, it makes it difficult to cut through and find out exactly what's happening under the covers. One aspect that some are looking at now is the rise in dollar LIBOR contract rates. So these have tripled the cost of short-term borrowing so far this year for the international system, and this is leading to inflation worries. Tim Price joins us now, who's the VT Price Value Portfolio. Tim, welcome. Thank you. And um, these. Um, three months dollar LIBOR rates are just below 0.9%. Explain exactly what this means when US rates are between 025 and 0.5%. So, so Fed funds is the target rate and that's the target rate at which the Fed effectively would like banks to be lending to each other overnight. The fact that the market rate is three times that suggests that the markets or well, the markets pricing in tighter credit, availability of credit, availability of capital, it suggests that the Fed is now behind the curve and that market interest rates are on the way up and ultimately the Fed may have to raise the Fed funds target rate. But this is only a small rise. I mean, this has tripled so far this year to just shy of 0.9%. These are small numbers, aren't they're they? They're small numbers, but they're coming off a very low base. So the, the, the point that Andrew Haldane made, I think about two years ago, who's the chief economist at the Bank of England, is that people sometimes forget just how low interest rates are. You've got now $16 trillion of sovereign debt globally trading at a negative yield, which in itself is a huge absurdity. But in terms of market interest rates and policy rates, they have never been this low in 5,000 years. So they, 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 they've risen a little, but they've come off effectively a base of zero. So what's this mean? Why can't interest rates now go up? Why? I mean, inflation is what the whole exercise of QE was all about. Exactly right. So it, it, it's a huge perversity. So you, you've now got these ironies whereby, say, in the UK, you've got inflation building on the back of Brexit, on the back of the sterling devaluation against the dollar and, and euro. And inflation was all, always what, what QE was about. So Mark Cohen has kind of got his way. But clearly, now there's some uncertainty in the market as to whether we actually are comfortable with that outcome or not. The reason why it's going to be very difficult for central banks to raise rates today and into the in near future is there's, amount, there's a gigantic amount of, of debt out there, government debt not least. And the value of that debt will be imperiled if rates rise. So the one iron law in finance is that if interest rates go up, bond prices fall. Bond prices are tip bonds are typically fixed coupon instruments. They give you a fixed, a fixed amount every year. If interest rates rise, they make that fixed coupon relatively less attractive. So the price of the bond falls to compensate investors. But the US economy is still growing. I mean, last week here in the UK, we saw better than expected GDP yeah. numbers. Just today, we've seen better than expected manufacturing data out of China. The economy is moving forward. Can't we sustain just this little bit of inflation? Um, yeah, I mean, in, in a sense, you could argue that a little bit of inflation is is no bad thing. Personally, I'd like to see it, I'd like to see an inflation target rate of zero because I don't see why we should be used to having, say, a target rate of 2% because that means our, every year our money is, is worth 2% less than before. So I'm not sure why, why we were ever allowed to accept a, a positive inflation target rate. But that's the one we have. That's the one that central banks are following. Um, the thing about inflation is we know from the past, particularly, say, from the stagflationary 70s, the inflation genie it's all very well saying, let's let him out of the bottle, but can you get him back in again? But the inflation um, aspect of this is an interesting point. We've got a situation now where we have this debt pile that you've explained. Inflation is almost necessary to shrink that debt Absolutely, pile, which terms. again is going to be good news. So, so long as we don't take on any more debt, this is the right way forward, surely. Uh, be careful what you wish for. So I think what we're living through now is in an extraordinary period in, in uh, unintended consequences coming home to roost. So again, we, we cited the figure earlier, 16 trillion of government debt with a negative yield, which is, which is absurd, clearly, clearly absurd. Um, there's much more debt behind that. So McKinsey uh, suggested two years ago, I think it was, that far from deleveraging after the, the height of the crisis in 08 when Lehman Brothers failed, governments have collectively added another $57 trillion on top of it. There is so much debt out there, the va again, to repeat, the value of that debt will be imperiled if interest rates rise. So the authorities, the central bank authorities, have got the most difficult, maybe the most difficult job in the world because what, what, what you, it's like kind of like they have a, the Goldilocks target objective. A little inflation so that you, you, you manage the debt pile, but not too much because you don't want to spook the bond market. It's not a, not a, it's not a, a task I'd wish on my worst enemy. 
Um, let's, let's just take this on another tack because um, in the last seven or eight years there's been a lot more regulation in the market for banks yep. and we're told that banks, insurance companies, those that manage our money mm. are in a far better, far stronger, far more capable position than they ever were. So if this uh, storm is coming, we're in a better position to face it, aren't we? Um, you could all, I, the way I'd describe it is the US banking system is in better health than it was in 2008 because the US banks largely recapitalize themselves. UK's banks are probably somewhat better off than they were in 2008 at the height of the crisis because again they've, they've, they've done some capital raising and they've, 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 they've tried to manage their balance sheets. The, the glaring hole in all this is, Euro, is Europe's banks, is the Eurozone banking system. The fact that Deutsche Bank's yeah. shares are still close to you know, an all-time low. Um, there's still big concerns over Deutsche Bank, which is clearly a systemically important bank. Someone once said, never let a good crisis go to waste. But it looks like in Europe, everyone just sort of fell asleep and took very little, made very little effort to, 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 to move the banking system back towards health. And clearly, zero or negative interest rates don't help the banks because they, it crushes their margins. OK, let's, let's, let's step back and then take a, another look at how all this could impact on our day-to-day -day finances. Um, we, we, if, if interest rates go up, we've got debts, we've got to manage those debts, how are we going to service them? Can, are we going to, not going to be able to service them? What market is going to give way, first well, of all? Well, there's different debt markets here. So you've got the government debt market, you, which is deemed to be the low risk or, or or, no, or risk-free um, market, you've got corporate debt and you've got household debt. As far as households are concerned, that'll be a function, that'll, be a, that, that'll reflect the, the ability of people's uh, ability to service their mortgages. In terms of the corporate sector, you know, corporate rates are still very, very low in the corporate bond market and the government market, as we know, yields are sort of still close to all-time lows, although those yields are starting to pick up. From an investor's perspective, I'd argue that pretty much every part of the bond market is now uninvestable. So nobody who has a, who has a choice who's completely unconstrained should be touching any of this stuff. OK, so if, if, if the bond bubble bursts, what else happens in other aspects of the market? Good question. So the bond, the bond market is the single biggest market in the world. It dwarfs the size of stocks. So in the event that you had a disorderly uh, shake up in bond prices, which isn't necessarily destined to happen, but it could happen because of the scale of the bond market today, then it is plausible to think there'd be some fallout in the, the other major tradable asset class, which is listed stocks. Right, OK, so if we follow the idea that we've now got an overvaluation, what sort of worst case scenario could we see affect stocks? How could stocks be affected by the worst case? Well, 1929 to 1932, which is the, the peak to trough market in the Dow, uh, in the, the Great Crash, in other words, just ahead of the, the Depression, stocks fell 89%. Right. <laughs> so that's, that's, a, that's, that's an example of a, of a tremendously poor outcome. That doesn't, that doesn't remotely mean that it's going to happen this time around. Yeah. But an overvalued market, if, if that's what we have, and I think the US market is particularly overvalued, an overvalued market can become undervalued. Mm. So in other words, markets always overshoot, they, they don't follow a middle ground. Mm. So it, you know, it could, could be unpleasant. A place to hide? Um, I think there are a couple of places, probably two or three instruments or asset types that, that are, are worth, always worth having, but particularly valuable today. One would be value, deep value investments, particularly stocks look for those markets in the world that aren't conspicuously overpriced at all and I'd argue most of those markets are in Asia today. Because um, you're keen on Vietnam I think. Yeah, Vietnam right? is, a, is a big favourite market of ours. It's a frontier market so it comes with additional risk but by the same token it's, it's super cheap, it's growing like a train, highly educated workforce, big, big workforce, wage rates are a third the rate of China. There's a lot going for Vietnam. Um, Japan we like, but there are pockets of value out there, but they're, they're typically along the road less travelled. Value stocks work. I'd argue that momentum strategies also work if you can find managers that can deploy them, trend following momentum strategies. Um, and the third and arguably the most important pillar, or certainly a primus inter pares of those three, would be gold, um, a store of value that historically has, has served well in times of crisis. Bullion, stocks or what? Bullion, stocks, ETFs. both. Right. Both. Yeah. OK. All right, look, Tim, we've got to leave it there. Thanks uh, indeed for joining us, uh, to taking all that apart and putting it back together again. Uh, Tim Price there from VT Price Value Portfolio.